thank you for letting us come and present in your class. Evan, take it out. Hello, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, so, so I'm going to share with you a little bit about my project that's called Secret City. Um, Secret City is a, is a video series that investigates and critically examines the role of, of the military um, and how it has shaped San Diego, as well as exploring um, the, some of the history of the anti-war movement here in San Diego and Oceanside and the general San Diego region. Um, how many of you are artists? Okay. How many are just art appreciators? Okay, okay. it's all good, it's all good. Um, so I, uh, as Alessandra mentioned, I went to school uh, in fine arts. And so that was actually, I did like what you might consider like studio art. So I was making sculptures, interactive installations, doing a lot of experimenta experimentation with materials um, in a much different way than than um, than the work I'm going to show you, um, which is primarily all entirely video. But I would say that I have like brought a lot of the experimentation that I've had over the years into the the form of video. Um, but what I primarily do is uh, is nonfiction, like documentary, experimental documentary stories. Um, so. I think to understand the, 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 the Secret City project, I'm going to show you a clip from a previous film, which was actually my first film I ever, had ever created. And I actually started it in, at City College here in central San Diego. And a, a professor helped me continue to create it, um, or at least coached me, you know, like coached me and, and helped me sort of like mentally process the act of creating a film, which is. Um, is that can be very intense actually, considering this is also a very personal story. And um, I'm just going to play it. This is actually just a trailer for it, but it'll give you the gist. Nana, I want to know about our family's past. You know, like, what makes me who I am today? How does our family's past inform my identity today? Ah! Hace un año que hoy se cumple en este día. Seguimos contando en el school de Santa America y mis pequeños. Te ha gustado la noche con Marco de Quinto. It's as if the past wants me to be confused about my identity. So yeah, just a quick trailer, just to kind of give you a gist of um, kind of the style that I ha was working in. I, I basically was taking um, photos, um, which is one of the images that you saw in the trailer. I was taking family photos and sort of animating them, bringing them to life. Um, so I was like cutting, cutting images up in Photoshop of my grandmother of myself, of other family members. There was that image of, of the man singing. That was my great-grandfather. It wasn't actually him singing, but he, he actually was a singer. But um, I was sort of retelling the story of our, of our family's history and their, the, our story of, uh, of assimilation into American culture um, after migrating from Mexico, but um, uh, over the course of like three generations. And so what, what does that look like? And also, how does memory change over the course of, of all of those years? And uh, I definitely learned a lot about that, that first, uh, that this was a, a medium that I wanted to continue to explore, that I, I, I enjoy telling like nonfiction stories, um, and, and that I like the, the type of experimentation that's possible with it. Um, but after finishing this, this story, I wanted to just expand on the, on the, the, the approach, the technical approaches that I learned. So I was animating it all by hand. So this was an image of my great-grandmother 
um, but I was cutting it up and all of these dots, I was literally like trying to move them like via my mouth, you know, <laughs> in the program to try to get her to talk or, you know, whatever was happening in the scene. Um, and that is a, an extremely tedious process. So I thought, you know, that was, this would have been amazing to, to, if I was to redo this, I would actually love if family, the family members who I was perhaps interviewing, they could perform the animations themselves. And so I started researching that, you know, a lot of these techniques that I've been doing, I'm just kind of learning online, like I'm learning it and experimenting all of myself. No one really taught me how to do this. So I thought, well, okay, if interviewees can like have a camera in front of their face and it's mounted, they can move however they want and I can take the data from the, the, the interview, the motion data, and then use it to animate their, the, something else, you know, another image, another, maybe a 3D model or something. <coughs> So this is years later after that film that I just showed you was completed. Um, and I just started experimenting, but this is just a photo of, of an interviewee that I, that I had perform and also just kind of converse with me. Um, and I just, again, like not really knowing <laughs> exactly what any given story is going to be about, which is sometimes how documentary is. It's, uh, it's it's a very much can be a, an, ex, an exploration, kind of an experiment. Sometimes stories, you start very, very vast, and then you slowly like narrow down into what it is. And uh, this is uh, me interviewing uh, a woman, Lely Hayslip. She was a, a Vietnamese refugee uh, during the Vietnam War and came, um, like a lot of Vietnamese refugees, uh, came to San Diego and Oceanside at that time. Um, but there was actually a film made about her. Uh, I forget the name of it. It, was, it has actually like Tommy Lee Jones. It was a very a big film. So there's many films about Vietnam and the Vietnam War. Um, so this is kind of what the interview process looks like sometimes with me. I actually have the person wearing a, a camera, you know, on their head, which is a very strange process, even for me, like learning that this is what I'm asking someone to do. Um, and so they wear these dots on their face and I sometimes have like them perform uh, a previously written script or we just converse and sort of like, you know, they tell their stories in a, in a just a fluid sort of way. Um, This isn't from that interview, but this was uh, an early experiment. So again, it, it, that was uh, just an experiment. Like, how can I actually make this happen? Can I make it work? And um, you know, that was a perf that was performed by uh, an actually a local Chicano theater artist. His name is Macedonio Arteaga, and he's part of a theater group uh, named Iscali Teatro Iscali. And again, that was the very beginnings of this project, like, okay, what is this about? I'm just going to write something, have someone perform it, let's see what happens. And then I started getting into this idea of like putting stories in, in public spaces that are embedded and the, the, the surroundings around us, they tell the stories. And they can tell stories that are, that are, are hidden, are not really available to us in, a, in an approachable way. And I think Around that time, um, I was, I think I had my, my mom and my sister in town 
uh, they live in Arizona, and um, I was coming across like the the Midway. Have you, do you all, are you all familiar with the Midway Museum in in the downtown area? It's basically like a giant uh, ship. It's a giant naval ship. It's a it's a war craft. It's an aircraft, and um, it completely takes over your field of vision, and you know, and it's it's also a tourist destination where people can kind of like enjoy San Diego. And I, I thought this was the most like absurd thing I had ever like experienced to be like showing my mother around, like oh, this is where I live, you know. Um, and there's this giant war machine that just is supposed to be an enjoyable experience, you know. Um, and so I was like, I, I, this is, that was it. Like, I have to do a story about militarism in San Diego. And um, I think, like, you know, as you live here, I've lived here for maybe 11, 12 years. As you're around, you, you slowly sort of, like, take it in, you know. You slowly realize little elements that the military is deeply, deeply embedded here. And, um, but... Uh, without any investigation, it's really hard to truly understand like what what it what is that you know? It's just kind of like this ominous presence that is actually hard to truly understand like how it it shapes the the region that we're in and it shapes sort of like the the fabric of our culture you know um, here in the city and um, yeah, so this was something that I wanted to investigate. <clears throat> and I had this idea of, of using this, uh, this painting sort of concept, which is uh, like, a, it's called tableau. This is like a tableau painting, where there's, it, it's very hard to describe what it, a tableau actually is, but it's, it's like a scene where multiple sort of things are happening. And you actually see it in um, a lot of Mexican muralism, um, which this is by Orozco, Clemente Orozco, and this is in Bellas Artes in, in Mexico City. Um, I consider this also like a tableau painting, and also Rivera had a, a very similar style where there's many characters sort of making an entire scene all at, all at once. Um, and sort of like somewhat playing on that idea uh, with, with these statues, I thought, okay, I can make I can make things move uh, uh, in our environment and, and what kind of things do I want to bring to life to sort of tell these, these stories, you know? Um, and sort of taking the idea of a tableau where, where the camera doesn't ever move, but it's still living in some way. You know, the camera is always static um, and there are multiple, sort of like a cacophony of, of stories happening, you know? And also this idea that, that this some, some forms of muralism, Mexican muralism, and Chicano muralism, which is that um, these are voices, the stories that are within the murals are voices like from, from the community, so to speak. And, um, and so this is what happened next. And also this is uh, something that over the course of like, um, four years, kind of learning the process and figuring out who is going to tell the story. This is a shortened version of a, of a longer video. I'll just play it and then explain after. If once American war memorials started to acknowledge their complicity as perpetrators of violence, it might sound like an alarming cacophony of voices. And maintaining their state sanctioned commemorative function, we find ourselves in a city within a city, a celebratory simulation. In the carefree beach town of San Diego, California, there are countless memorials and tourist attractions which celebrate and commodify this violence. But 
still it's like an elephant in the room that nobody acknowledges. When we're walking around or maneuvering around a military city like San Diego, we very much can tell that the story that is being fixed here through monuments is a military history, right? Where um, if we think about it, it's commemorating, it's celebrating the, um, the military interventions as if they are um, battles that have been won, rather than thinking of them as commemorating someone that lost something, right? Like a racialized population lost land, perhaps money, perhaps then, right, they're not being represented in this history. It's a very one-sided, very sanitized history of state violence. San Diego became so extremely important was when the Panama Canal actually was completed. It's 600 miles closer to the western end of the Panama Canal than San Francisco. In 1900, the Chamber of Commerce was looking at San Diego and how is it going to develop. And this, we're talking about 1900, 1901, that time frame. Uh, Admiral Dewey had just uh, beaten the Spanish in, in the Philippines. America had just become an empire. There were now only two major Pacific powers, the United States and Japan. So as a result, when the planners were looking at it, they were saying, what do we need here in case there's an invasion? Or if Mexico made a treaty with a foreign power like Japan and the Japanese army wound up being supported out of Mexico, what do we need to defend the border from an invasion from the south? Now, one of the things was a national issue. Our battleships were in the Atlantic. Now that we have a Pacific Empire, we need to be able to get the battleships from the Atlantic to the Pacific without sailing 14,000 miles around South America. So all of a sudden, you have this big demand for a canal, and you have the big demand for a naval presence to basically police and protect American interests along the Pacific Coast all the way down to the Panama Canal. San Diego looked at itself and found itself in a much better position. It was the southernmost Pacific port in the United States where a naval presence could race down and defend the western end of the canal. So all that's going on as we speak between 1900 and 1910. A lot of political lobbying being done to start getting the Navy interested in coming in force in the same day. Okay, I'm just going to pause there for a second. So, because um, this was actually um, originally created as a, with the idea of doing a, an installation, like um, as opposed to something that you would watch. Um, maybe online or like in, in this fashion, which is a kind of a more of a theatrical experience. Um, so I was, the idea was to do two, two video projections. One that would have all entirely archival images where you have on the left, and the one on the right would be entirely these animated statues. Um, and I think when I was doing this, uh, a lot, uh, the, the pandemic started and I was like, okay, this just has to be experienced. Like, I can't like wait anymore, you know, I'm going to try to make this available to people. So I had this idea, okay, let's just put it on, on one screen and do the, the two, the two screens split on one. Um, and, and to me, that was also a way to create this idea of, of, 
uh, sort of this bipolar experience that you have in San Diego, which is um, kind of what you see here. Uh, you know, you have like this very aggressive, violent sort of uh, events happening, you know, where there's bombs. This is actually, um, this was the, an air show up in, in Miramar. Um, and so, you know, it's a, it's a tu we have this bi bipolar experience, which is like uh, tourism, something that's supposed to be pleasant, something that's like enjoyable, but there's this also this violence like right beside it, right? So this idea of doing this two, two screens was like my way to accomplish that bipolar sort of experience. Um, and I'm not sure, I always wonder <laughs> if people um, sort of like actually uh, ingest what this, what this statue is saying, which is about the history of sort of just early, early developments of San Diego's militarism. And that's kind of been a lot of the, the, the intentions behind this aspect of the project, which is to sort of just explain, and for me to explore, like I know nothing about this, but I know that it affects us, right? I know that it affects the city. How can I, how can I learn more and how can I explore this with others, you know? So what he's explaining is kind of just of a more uh, geopolitical um, uh, strategy behind US militarism and policy, which is that San Diego as a, as a geographic like location um, is, serves as a very um, strategic place for, for US, um, like U.S. control of not only the, the, the global south, but also the Pacific. San Diego is the most southwestern city in the United States. So uh, in terms of like access to all of Latin America and, and the Pacific, it serves as perfect for those, for those reasons. That's essentially what he's what he's saying, um, but also at a very specific time in U.S. history, which is when the Panama Canal is being, is being constructed, which is down south from us in, in Panama, uh, which served as, as a way for, for goods to be routed, but also as a way for U.S. naval ships to be not having to go all the way down, um, down all of the, the entire south. South American continent, right? They can travel across seas very quickly that way. So San Diego serves as a, as a very strategic place for, for that purpose, right? Um, so I always wonder when I show this, like, uh, if people are actually, like, <laughs> listening to it. That's something, as a, as a filmmaker, that at least what I do, I'm trying to, like, be effective, right? Not only is it, like, an artistic experience, um, and kind of like an, I'm, I'm hoping to evoke something, but I always um, am curious about the effectiveness of the storytelling that's happening. Um, let's see. And then, so as you can see, there are other people uh, that are interviewed, um, but I also include myself in some of my stories because sometimes I'm, I'm maybe reading about something or learning about something. I, I don't know who else is going to tell the story, so I just include myself in these in these narratives, you know. Um, and and I think another aspect of this was okay. I'm I'm bringing um, these statues to life, right? And this was probably about four years ago, and um, there is a lot of conversation about um, public monuments and their role in sort of like. Um, promoting uh, white supremacy, essentially promoting colonialism, and you see a lot of like colonial monuments. I think on the East Coast, um, but here in San Diego, there are many monuments that are more like imperialist monuments, monuments that celebrate uh, commemoration of of militarism, commemoration of World War One, World War Two, and so on. You know. Um, and so I thought this has a different flavor than some of the, 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 com the conversations that are happening around colonialism, say, on the East Coast. And 
specifically regarding colonial monuments. Um, and so I thought this same conversation could apply to the monuments that we have here, which are a lot of military monuments. If you go down by the USS Midway, which is where a lot of the, those scenes were filmed, you'll see, I don't know how many monuments, statues like, like these. Um, this is a pilot, you know, there's a, there's a, um, one of the other images was like an, uh, an admiral, you know, so. I wanted to sort of like present this idea that something had happened um, in these scenes, um, but after you know, after we we remove these monuments, then where do the stories go? So after sort of like the suggestion of of perhaps toppling a monument, I wanted to still retain the, these stories that we would not otherwise know, right? So. Um, it's kind of just like a conversation that, that I think I'm trying to have, which is that, of course, we, we shouldn't be promoting um, imperialism like this, but we should also continue the conversation, what, what are these histories and how have they shaped the regions that we, that we live in? Um, so yeah, then the story continues. And again, this is a more shortened version of a, of a, of a very much longer story. As your voyage from New York by way of Panama near the Thames, your first port of call in California is San Diego, southwestern gateway of the United States, where in local phrase, California began, for here was the first white settlement on our Pacific coast. After dredging the city's harbor to house the nation's fleet of naval warships, San Diego would become the hub for American military activity. Throughout the 20th century, the city would give land jurisdiction away by selling waterfront and inland property to the military. San Diego would bring white settlers and military families with the lure of perfect sunshine and the promise of a career in a booming industry. But hidden beneath the surface of the plan for a white utopia, has been the cost of people and natural resources of various occupied territories south of the U.S. and throughout the Pacific. It's sort of a hidden history, it's a hidden aspect of, of San Diego. When people think of the city, they think of the perfect sun, they think of going to the beach, um, they think of getting a tan here, but what doesn't immediately come to mind is the heavy presence of the military and how that influences society. Uh, and more specific to the immigration and borderlands experience is the presence of a large paramilitary force such as the, the Border Patrol. And, and the normalization of violence is, is part of, uh, is one of the factors of what is known as low intensity conflict theory, where violence becomes so normalized that people stop questioning it. It becomes part of their daily routines. The militarization, I think, of, of our communities has really taken shape from the formation of policy around uh, around wars. Even with uh, with uh, the Democrat uh, Bill Clinton as, as president, where he permitted uh, the implementation of Operation Gatekeeper in the southwestern uh, region of, of California, it intended to push the migration flow from urban centers into the more mountainous and desert areas, and then that's when we start seeing an increase of border deaths in Arizona. I think it would be a mistake to not talk about the U.S.-Mexico border without uh, contextualizing it within its historical past, and, uh, and the same sort of uh, 
politics of fear stems from the belief that the U.S. Um, had the uh, authority and that they were anointed by God uh, to expand their land and to acquire land through violence, through force, through war. Um, and the U.S. borderlands are a reflection and an expression of that extended history. Bold and beautiful are the shores of California, westward goal of your coast-to-coast voyage. Here in the broad Pacific pearls and falls on the sunny frontier of America. So, okay. what if... so um, obviously, you know, we live uh, right up against the U.S.-Mexico border here. I think, um, I think there, you know, it's interesting, like, to, to include, like, a, a, a piece about the U.S.-Mexico border within this conversation about militarism, because I, I, what I have been feeling is um, a lot of the conversation around militarism at the border um, doesn't always include much of the conversation about the other branches of the military. And I, I would consider the Border Patrol and, and the militarization of the border to be amongst the, the same, the same um, sort of like uh, machinery as, as the other branches of the military. Um, because uh, as we talked about, like San Diego as a strategic location, the border is is very much a part of that um, control of South, the global South, as, as well as the Pacific. So the Pacific Ocean very much acts like a border in the same way that the actual border fence does, right? So um, I wanted to include other community member stories about how they analyze the border as, as a part of this whole machinery. And um, I think um, also in representing images of the Border Patrol that they are simply just standing, right? They're, perhaps this is not like the violence that we always think about. This is uh, the normalization of violence that he was talking about. They can just stand there, be using um, um, funding while still not doing anything, right? So it's about like what is, what is the use of, of them, them standing there and, and presenting themselves with, with guns and ammo and all of this. Um, sort of like presenting this idea of like a uselessness. To me, that's kind of how I approach this image. Um, and let's see. Um, yeah, there, there's, there's a lot to be said, <laughs> to be said about the, the border, but I think um, to include to include it is is a very much uh, an important aspect as just as much as we we don't know um, about um, sort of the anti-war movement and sort of like the machinery I, I feel like it is it is important to include this conversation about the border in the in the whole entire conversation is kind of like the, the meaning behind this So one of the things that monuments do is that they are almost permanent fixtures in a space. We take them for granted, we move past them, and we don't ask who, what do they represent, what narrative are they telling, you know, the history, like who placed this here. It's very much taken for granted, which is something we do with spaces all of the time. And in that, not having to question the function, the power, the job that a monument is doing in a place is where the power of the state lies. Most monuments are placed there through state funding, through um, committees that are invested in telling histories of the nation. The fact that we don't necessarily think of them that way actually gives them more power to continue to be there and kind of create a history and fix it into the space. Right? There's no movement, it's very static. And I think our job as we move through these spaces is to question, why are they here? Right? Can they be moved? Is this, are we really fixed in the story?
militarism is not just bodies in the military or hardware like weapons. It's a value system. So those values discourage questioning. They discourage dissent. And when um, they have a large enough influence over the culture and over society, then it depresses uh, people's willingness to, to challenge the things that, um, that, that they maybe feel are wrong or, or challenge the impact that, that spending so much money on, on war has on them personally. a decision, a political decision was made that uh, the U.S. Uh, policy in Southeast Asia persecuting the war there was becoming more difficult to defend. It, it was being challenged politically. So the strategy they came up with in, in Washington and the Pentagon was to shift into air war. And one of the aircraft carriers was formed around the USS Constellation. Uh, and it was home based in here in San Diego. It was scheduled eventually to return in 1971 to, to continue to conduct bombing raids in Southeast Asia. So because it was a, uh, a ship here in San Diego, uh, a, a couple of groups, a community-based uh, anti-war group and a veterans organization, got together and they decided, hey, we're going to try to conduct a poll, a citizen poll. And so they organized a vote and they focused on the question of whether or not the USS Constellation should return to continue carrying out the air war, yes or no. The ship carries a crew of 4,800 men, but when it left this morning, seven crewmen were not aboard. These seven men and two others from another ship sought sanctuary at two San Diego churches because they said they opposed the Vietnam War. And I told them for about four months ago that I wasn't going to sell the ship. I don't believe it anymore, and I wouldn't go over there, and I'm not going to go over there. And I hope they did it. I got a phone call, I think, and somebody said, hey, nine of the sailors decided that they would refuse to board the ship and go back, and they took sanctuary. Christ the King Church in Southeast San Diego until in the middle of the night, uh, U.S. Marshals broke in and uh, handcuffed them and, and arrested them and they were flown out to the uh, ship uh, for legal proceedings against them. Okay, so, uh, so that last one was, you know, so as I'd been doing this project exploring militarism and sort of like a critical examination of it here um, that I started to meet people or get wind of people that have that have been around for multiple decades now and that were um, present and active in a very lively anti-war movement here in San Diego and, and Oceanside and just the entire region and um, that to me really was like a next sort of like phase of this of this project so I had been doing these animations with these statues and um, kind of exploring it in a very specific way exploring militarism in a very broad general way I think um, but to me the idea of a, of a lively anti-war movement here in San Diego was like wow this is you know we always in terms of like progressive like politics in San Diego we're, we always it always feels like we're in the shadow of Los Angeles and San Francisco, and even just in terms of, of like cult culture, right? So it, you know, just to be analyzing it, we always. I'm an artist, and I also am from Los Angeles, so I, I you know, I've I've been here in San Diego for over a decade, and I'm always, you know, um, it, it's work. It's a lot of like work to to make to make opportunities happen here. So the the question is always like. Uh, how you know how is how is San Diego the way it is in comparison to places like Los Angeles um, in terms of like radical politics and 
and, and everything, you know. And so when I started learning that the anti-war movement here was, was so lively, it, it served as sort of like an alternative um, history that perhaps many people are unaware of. You know, we hear of many stories uh, related to these things from other places, but I, I feel like the, the story of anti-war in San Diego is completely pushed under the rug. And, um, and I started to feel like perhaps this story, this way of telling stories, um, which are, are very in-depth, you know, like this one about the, 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 the aircraft carrier, carrier that people were attempting to stop from leaving the San Diego Harbor and continuing on to Vietnam. That was a whole entire campaign. So the story was super, super in-depth. You know, it's not the way some of the other storytellers, some of the other statues were speaking, or kind of speaking more broadly about history. And this is someone with first-hand experience, you know, of these kinds of stories. And I was kind of like considering in my head, like, how is this the best way to tell the story, doing this animation? But I continue forward. Um, sorry, I should go back to those. Looking for, oh, OK. I continue forward. And uh, this was probably at the beginning of, of the pandemic in March uh, of 2020. And I actually was like, OK, a lot of these, these people that experienced these these things firsthand, some of them are, are a lot older now, you know, they're in their late 70s or, or older. And, and, you know, given the pandemic, um, the, the sort of fragileness of, of people's lives at, at, at this time, I was like, okay, I'm not going to meet in person with anybody, but I'm going to send my equipment to them via mail so that they can set up uh, the the animation themselves and I sort of this was like an instruction packet you know that um, shows them how to put the camera on their head and place these blue these blue markers on their face in that way and then we would interview each other over zoom but they would have all the equipment and so I would kind of walk them through it this was kind of a very a uh, desperate measure to continue the project, hoping that, you know, it could, it would continue. And so this is uh, a gentleman, Robert Mahoney, who is um, one of the first um, people in the Navy in San Diego to start sort of like an underground movement of, of, of people who were fighting against one, the sort of cruel treatment of the Navy to people of color in the Navy, and also, you know, bringing up issues of, of criticism towards the war at the time. And this is probably 1969 that he was here amongst another, a bigger group of people that had like what you would consider like more communal houses in, in the Hillcrest area. And um, I, I think he was, yeah, he was living in, um, now he's living up in the Bay Area, so I had to send my equipment to, to interview him to do that. Um, and let's see. So I started learning about um, the many underground of, um, papers, like sort of newspapers that, that people were, were creating at that time all over the place in San Diego. There were, there were so much like activity um, and they were producing like literature that was analyzing the war at the time. And, uh, and this, is, this became more of, like, more of like an exploration, sort of like an investigation of, of, of these things where I'm just like amazed that these documents exist and I had no understanding of them prior, you know. So at the time, this was a paper called Black Unity and it was produced out of Camp Pendleton in Oceanside. Um, and there was a house up there called the Green Machine where a lot of um, people in the military and non-military would organize and, and sort of create uh, a movement against the war at that time and against cruel treatment of, of primarily in Oceanside, of primarily black marines. Um, 
and I was actually able to to talk to these people. I'm actually going. This this project project is continuing. I'm I'm going to be actually interviewing um, Cliff Mansker, who is here on the left, and then there's a Chicana woman. Her name is Teresa Cerda, and she was a young woman who was 16 years old in high school at the time, and would actually. Um, go on to the base at Camp Pendleton, uh, figure out how to get on base, and was communicating with um, political prisoners who were in prison on, on what they call the brig, which is like a, a military prison, um, for their political sort of stances and voices. And so she was communicating between prisoners on the base and um, bringing back messages to the Green Machine, which was the coffee house that people organized at in Oceanside. And um, so these papers were sort of like reflections of the, that movement at that time. Um, this was Duck Power, who the guy, uh, the guy that I sent that equipment to, this was a paper that he was involved in, primarily uh, people who were in the Navy producing this, these, these, this literature. So it says in the middle, you live in the belly of the monster, get it on. So belly of the monster meaning San Diego, the belly of the monster, like the, the core of the, the military establishment. Um, and it just goes on and on. Once you, once you meet one person who is still alive and, and still in contact with others who are here in San Diego, it just becomes like wildfire. And I slowly started talking to more and more people and um, figuring out which stories I like, actually want to tell that, are, that can, be, um, can reflect this, this period. Uh, and then I, I met um, a, a guy who was a professor at SDSU around 1972. Um, his name is Peter Bomer. And he uh, was very vocal about his politics at SDSU, very vocal about the war at the time. And so he was kind of like criminalized by the, the college, by the police, by all these different organizations. Um, and at one point, there was a, 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 a demonstration in Del Mar um, on a, at the, these railroad tracks that um, a bunch of kids were attempting to stop um, weapons from being transported from Los Angeles to San Diego to continue towards Vietnam. So they were going to impede weapons from, from moving right on the railroad tracks. And uh, he, Peter, someone who was very vocal at the time, who didn't really have a hand in organizing this, was um, convicted of a felony, <clears throat> and um, and there's this whole court, uh, there's this whole trial with Peter and multiple individuals. So I was actually able to find Peter, and I actually found a, the first thing I learned was that someone had shot that event on film, and I was like, wow, <laughs> you know, just like learning that these these documents of this period exist was amazing to me. And there was this trial. Um, and that, you know, that there was evidence. So I just continued to, to search and, and interview people. And this is, this is an in-progress piece, um, but you're getting a sneak peek of it. There was a call uh, for a party on the tracks Friday afternoon, May 12th. Some of the organizers said it's going to be a demonstration of the train for supplies. We've done research, and the idea was to stop the train at least for a short time to go into San Diego, the port here to be shipped to, uh, to Vietnam. Yeah, and it was, it was, at that time it was more of an open area too, because I remember physics, and that's not exactly right. Yeah. 
I was very aware there were all sorts of police helicopters above, mainly sheriffs, and there were other police we could see in the distance, like in riot gear, but not right on us. Music band. There were these railroad ties that were right by the track, long wooden ties. People made a decision to go down and to set the ties on fire. Within a minute or two, people go down to the tracks. I saw the fire being set, I saw the sheriffs charging, and then I start going up the hill. I was thinking, yeah, you know, I had a lot of other arrests going on at the time, so I was more worried about being beaten, to be honest, and so I just thought a place where I'm not going to get beaten. So I went to this bush and with at least one or two friends of mine. And I've never been to be a tree hugger, but I was kind of a tree hugger that night. Sheriff's Department. 
but I think the tape was doctored. It was really low quality, and they claimed the tape that I had told people to, uh, which I didn't do though. I had told people to set the pies on fire, but I personally did not direct that at that time. We have a lot of film for the whole demonstration. You work with what you have, I suppose. With film, you know, you didn't know what you shot at the time. You didn't know until you developed a film. Considering these haven't been stored archivally by any stretch of the imagination uh, over 50 years, they've held up incredibly well. I would go to the demonstrations which are happening literally weekly. I was sort of was interested in photography but had no formal training. And I started to take pictures for The Door, which was an underground uh, publication. Doing the demonstrations, I mean, if I saw guys who clearly were standing on the sideline and taking pictures of demonstrators and me or whatever, I figured they were probably police. In other words, they were trying to just infiltrate the organizations to get information to feed to the police. Sometimes it would stand up, I was taking a picture of them, or they were taking a picture of me. It became sort of a cat and mouse thing in some ways. I didn't know more than why I photographed him, probably because somebody speculated he was questionable. I said, well, what do you think that guy's taking pictures of? I mean, there's, not, you know, there's, there's a guy standing there with a long lens like that, he figured. The guy is probably a cop. If he were wired, it meant he was part of the demonstration, theoretically, right? Because he had to be there to observe what was going on and to record it. Well, somebody said he came, he volunteered, he would be help with distribution, whatever that means, you know, which is possible. Like I say, anybody could walk up. There was no, we didn't screen anybody. You didn't have to submit a resume. Okay. <laughs> Thanks for bearing through that. It's like a super rough cut, and the story is still, still developing. Um, I think, so just to kind of go back to like the approach, um, you know, in comparison to the animated statues, um, which I, again, I feel like the stories are more of a general scope on, on militarism. When I started meeting these individuals and, and sort of the depth of their stories, I was like, yeah, I, I don't feel, it feels weird to do this kind of like comical almost, you know, these animated statues. I can't really approach those stories in the same way. And, and the story just starts to unfold in very much like a true crime like documentary, you know? So it's like, yeah, this is the way it's going naturally. And, um, and it's, I feel very much just like a, a private investigator, you know? And to the point where I actually went to the last, the last um, sheriff that they mentioned He's still alive. I found his name where he lives. I actually went to his house and like, hey, are you willing to be interviewed? Um, obviously, it's like 50 years later and, and he was just, yeah, that's a, that's a whole other thing. But um, he was not willing to, to speak to me. But yeah, I just, I just feel like the process was completely different. So this is why the story is, is being produced in this way. Um, and it's still being covered. And actually, this guy, Peter, his, his court, his trial documents were sealed by the court. I actually went to the courthouse and, and, and tried to see if I could get access to them and learn that they were sealed. Um, you know, but the, the documents would have evidence of, of the wire recording, you know, um, that was used to, to convict Peter. So there's all these, these hidden sort of stories that, um, that I'm coming across and, um, and to me sort of are on the same plane as um, the idea of a secret city. <coughs> and that, you know, the anti-war movement is very much under, is, is not understood here in this region. And there's also a reason for that. One, because of how the politics are, are, are sort of positioned here, but also 
because movements in San Diego experience the same kind of surveillance, the same kind of violence that movements, the same movements experience in Los Angeles and other places, right? Surveillance by the FBI, by um, vigilante groups like this one called the Secret Army Organization, which is very much like a Minutemen group um, that, that if you all have heard of them. Um, <coughs> And so the same, the same reasons why, um, uh, you know, why after this, the civil, what we call the civil war period, like experienced, um, the, the, the anti-war period experienced sort of like, a, I don't know what you would call it, like a, a, a halt, I would say, um, specifically in San Diego at around 1975. Um, because of, of sort of like backlash against police, FBI, and all of these organizations, right? Um, and so people, and obviously the war ended, so people moved on. Um, but these kinds of ex these kinds of experiences are the reasons I was am feeling like this this the secret city is is exists in this way, you know. <coughs> and um, let's see what else. Go back here. So that's the, the sealed court document that I found. And I actually have, I found this lawyer to help me pro bono to, to unseal the document so that the story can continue. Um, and another thing that I, that I learned, well, I don't know if you'll be able to see, or see it here, but this, this thing that says Chicano Moratorium, are you all familiar with the Chicano Moratorium in Los Angeles? You must, you must, right? So there was a Chicano moratorium in Los Angeles that was, uh, the way I understand it, was originally initiated um, as a, a call against the, the war in Vietnam and specifically that, that, that war was targeting um, people of color um, and many Chicano youth at the time and um, that they were kind of being used as, as fodder um, in the war, um, and that many, um, uh, and the community was basically uh, attempting to say no, like end the war. Um, and but the 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 Chicano moratorium, I think, is is also very much understood as like a, a cultural sort of um, moment, right? <coughs> um, but it it. The, the idea of, of the anti-war aspect of it, I feel, I have been feeling like is, is not very much uh, part of the, as much as part of the conversation, it is part of the conversation, but I would say that is, it has advanced historically as very much a cultural moment in terms of like identity. And actually some of those images that I used in the, in the previous, in the very first film that I showed you um, those were some of the, there were, there were some archival in that that was used from um, films that were shot at the Chicano Moratorium. Um, but as I started reading these, uh, these documents of these underground papers that people were producing here in San Diego, I learned that there was a, what was called a Chicano Moratorium here in San Diego actually prior to the one in Los Angeles. And so people there was a, a very like active movement here in San Diego, but a lot of these aspects of of the movement here related to anti-war um, are very much not understood and, and not very much a part of the conversation of of what the movement say we are more familiar with here in San Diego, if that makes sense. So yes, there there's just been so much to explore. Um, and the, the story continues, so I've ba basically been approaching this project of Secret City as having multiple cycles. So the cycle of, of, of the monuments is its own, its own aspect of this project. And this new one that's, that's currently happening regarding the anti-war movement is, is a whole entirely different cycle, but within the Secret City project, and it has its own sort of like ma way that it manifests in terms of the visual approach and style that I make it. So, yeah, I think 
I think that's it that I have. And I would love to hear of any questions or any comments that you all have or anything, please. <laughs> Thank you.